Well, Dave, UFC 188 has come and gone. History was made here in Mexico City. But before we get to all of that, I feel like I must address for the viewers at home that we are filming tonight or this morning's post-fight wrap-up in a shower. We are. In a hotel shower. I hope you all appreciate this very much. This is the dedication that we have to the craft. Well, you know what, Ariel? Um, if you uh, remember my picks from the pre-fight show, I think I need a good shower right now. I think want to destroy the tape from, um, you know, I was wrong on pretty much everything. So let's just get that out of the way while we're at it. Very well said. They kicked us out of the arena, so we had to uh, tape it here. But it's all the same. Uh, what, what I mean, what what can we say? Uh, at the end of the day, Fabrizio Verdum is the new UFC undisputed heavyweight champion. He submitted Cain Velasquez in the third round, a failed takedown attempt, caught his neck, choked him out via guillotine. Cain tapped rather quickly. And now, on his resume, Fabrizio Verdum, the man who was cut, from the UFC back at UFC 90 after getting knocked out by JDS, has a submission win over Fyodor Milenko and now Cain Velasquez. What were you thinking when you saw that? Because it was a very surreal sight, and the entire arena, 21,000 plus, almost was stunned. Stunned silence. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, you sensed it was coming, and I think everyone in the arena sensed it was coming too. You know, during the first round, that the crowd during the first round of that fight, I think the last time I heard a crowd that loud was when GSP was fighting Matt Serra up in Montreal. And then you just kind of felt the nervous energy sort of build um, in the second round when Verdum just pretty much just started to pick Kane apart with his jab. And you saw, even as Kane was coming out for the second round, he was um, breathing pretty heavily. And, um, you know, that's where... Um, Verdum training up in Toluca, Mexico at 10,000 feet altitude just started to had more gas in the tank and started pushing forward. And yeah, you had the sense that it was coming. And um, in a way, Kane took a pretty vicious beating in the second round and into the third. It's almost, um, I don't want to say, yeah, I mean, yeah, it is in a way a credit to his toughness that he lasted as long as he did. But I do think that Verdum pretty much just broke him, which I never thought I'd yeah. have I'd say about Ken Velasquez in my life. Yeah, this wasn't cardio Kane. This wasn't the same Kane Velasquez that we've come to know and expect. And I'm wondering, I mean, it's hard for us to really answer the question on his behalf. But did you think it was the layoff, the altitude, a bit of both? Because, you know, come the second round, it was clear that he was spent. A little bit of both, plus the fact that Fabrizio Verdum has been doubted by everyone, yes. you know. Including us. Including us, all the way up to his run of the championship. It's hard to say what was what, you know. Um, I, I think on my part, I personally would like to see Velasquez take another fight before getting a rematch, simply because I want to get that idea, you know. Have him fight someone um, other than Verdum. Get him back in the cage at, you know, at, at not 9 billion feet altitude and um, see how he looks against someone else, you know. Maybe that'll give us a better, better kind of view on um, what exactly happened here tonight. You know, midway through the second round, I couldn't help but think of Javier Mendez, who told me on Monday that he had to convince Kane to come two weeks in advance. Kane wanted to come out, you know, the typical Tuesday, Monday before a fight, and he had to really fight him to... Come two weeks, he wanted to go three, four weeks, and they agreed on two. And I think that decision kind of bit him in the ass. You have Fabrizio Verdum, who's been here for 40 days. He was, you know, here for several months leading up to UFC 180 as well. He really did everything that he needed to do to prepare and be 100% for this fight. And now here he is pushing 40 UFC champion. Again, this is a guy who was cut from the UFC at UFC 90. Since then, he's won 9 of 10. But it's really, in my opinion, one of the great comeback stories in MMA history. Do you agree? Oh, absolutely. Look, he was... I was there for UFC 90 when Junior Dos Santos just big bolo punch knocked yeah. him out. And I never thought I'd see Fabrizio Verdum in the UFC again after he got cut. And, um, you know, like I said, he, he got... Not only did he get doubted everywhere along the way, but the way he's improved and become such a well-rounded fighter, you know? The only loss he had in that, um, in that stretch was to Alistair Overeem in that, you know, just flop to the ground approach. We never saw him do that again. He knew it was a mistake. He never did it again. And, uh, I mean, you know, he used to be considered just a jujitsu guy and the way he's taken it to everyone from Kane to Travis Brown and all down the line in the stand-up it's been absolutely remarkable watching his progression and you know I, I don't know what kind of a draw Fabrice Verdum is as far as pay-per-view is concerned but this really opens things up in the heavyweight division so many interesting 
you know, situations that could play out here. So many choices for the UFC all of a sudden that they didn't have. Think about Junior Dos Santos. I mean, he wasn't getting another shot at Kane. At least I didn't think he was. Now he has a legitimate case for another crack. And actually next. You know, next in line. And then you have Stipe Miocic and you have Andre Arlovsky and you have Alistair Overeem. You know, you got a lot of options. So what do you do? If you're the UFC, what do you do next for Fabricio Verdun? Uh, personally, Dos Santos is the fight that I want to see. You know, like, as I said earlier, I'd like to see Velasquez take another fight and kind of get his head straight again before we put him into another title fight. Junior beat Stipe recently, so that's kind of hard to, to vault Stipe ahead of him. And, yeah, you can make a case for Andre Olovsky, sure, but I just – there's just too much um – you know, it's just such a great storyline, you know, and especially you, you have to think now where does Fabrizio Verdum rank among the greatest heavyweights in history? And um, to avenge his loss to JDS, that would be, uh, I'm sure that would be a very, very uh, big appeal to Verdum's competitive instincts. Yeah, that's such a fun debate because this is a guy who has wins now over Fyodor. He has wins over Big Nog. Look what he did to Kane tonight. And again, who would have ever thought he'd be in that discussion, you know? I, I think that the UFC can't really go wrong with any of the choices. JDS, in my opinion, makes the most sense. And then you have, you know, a tough choice to make with Kane. Who do you book him against? Because, you know, this is, this is going to be really interesting, what they do with Kane next. You'd expect him to come back, you know, very determined, very strong, you know, um, uh, very motivated to win. But I'm not really quite sure what the right answer is there. Yeah, there aren't too many options. You know, if you go with the traditional UFC book, win with a win and loss with a loss, maybe Travis Brown. That's mm -hmm. kind of the only thing that comes to mind off the top of my head. You know, I don't think you want to wreck Stipe as a contender. Well, not that he'd necessarily lose to Kane, yeah. but I don't, I don't know if you want to mess with what Stipe has going now. I don't know if there is an obvious answer. Travis Brown jumps to mind just because there are two guys that are looking to get back on track, but I'm not sure. Yeah, and then, of course, maybe uh, Arlovsky now has to deal with Ben Rothwell. Maybe that wasn't the that case a couple of days ago, but right. maybe now he has right. to deal with him if he's not going to get a shot. All of a sudden, it feels like, even with the return of Josh Barnett, the heavyweight division, a lot more interesting tonight, as opposed to if Cain Velasquez would have won that fight. And then the rematch at some point down the line would be a lot of fun. And I'd like to see that rematch, by the way, neutral ground. Not to say that, you know... It just feels like maybe in Vegas or San Jose, something sure, like that. Sure. I, I don't want to see altitude. Is neutral ground. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. Where altitude doesn't play a factor. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, you said it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's talk about the co-main event now. Eddie Alvarez defeats Gilbert Melendez 29-28. He wins via split decision. And this is a guy who has fought now 30 pro fights, 11 and a half years as a pro fighter. And finally tonight, he picks up his first UFC win. A great story. He, he fought through some adversity, but it was a close fight. Do you think the judges got it right? I do think they got it right. Um, you know, it was interesting. At the end of the first round and into the second, um, I'm sure not. I'm sure I wasn't the only person who was disappointed with the way the fight was going, just because of the, you know, wasn't. I think everyone expected a barn burner going into this fight, but the way the story changed in this fight was pretty awesome. Um, you know, if the way things look for Eddie Alvarez after round one is eye swollen shut, he's already lost his first fight to Donald Cerrone. Not looking too good for him. If he had lost this fight, things were. Um, Things weren't looking too good for him for, for his UFC stint. Instead, just a tremendous gut check of a win. He's basically fighting with one eye. Um, managed to turn the fight into the type of fight that he likes to fight, you know, with his wrestling and his just aggressive transitions and getting up in Gilbert's face and, you know, not letting him take a breather. Um, I thought this was uh, just a, a great gut check of a victory, and it's it's – 3 a.m., so I forget what your original yeah. question was. But no, no, that was essentially it. Do you agree with the judges? You do. I think he won the fight really in the last minute of the second round. I think he stole that round. And then, of course, I, I think most people would agree that he won the third. That was really the most important part of the fight. It's a guy who blew his uh, his nose, and that led to his <laughs> eye swelling. And then the, the other eye actually started to swell yeah. towards the end of the fight as well. So he fought through a lot. But again, it felt like Melendez was getting a little tired. Like, I wonder if this is the same fight if it takes place, you know, back but, in you know, the United that States. That said, I mean... Gilbert has lost three of his last four fights now, and I understand it was against top-notch competition. And I just get the feeling like I haven't seen... It seems like Gilbert Melendez is not progressing as a fighter very much. It seems like he... Um, I don't know. He just he just isn't um, evolving as a fighter anymore. You're seeing the same thing that 
that worked for him when he was Strike Force champion, but this is just a division full of killers, and you can't just go in place and expect to um, maintain your spot forever. Yeah, five years later, though, after everything he's been through, especially this year, he's had some personal problems. You know, nice to see Eddie Alvarez finally get that first UFC win. And that really wasn't talked about all that much. And I mean, this is a big deal for a guy who had kind of been, you know, fighting for that respect for so long. I think that was a really great story. Now, Kelvin Gaslam has to fight at 185 tonight because Dana White told him no more 170. He makes Nate Marquardt quit, which is, you know, a tough thing to do. I know Nate Marquardt isn't the same fighter that he once was. I don't think anyone would argue against that, but he made him quit. And then after, we expected him to be able to uh, convince Dana White to go back to 170, but Dana White very emphatic, saying no, he is not going down to 170. He doesn't think he can make 170, and it's just not smart for him to do so. Are you surprised? A, at how emphatic Dana was, and, and B, do you think that Kelvin ultimately will be able to convince him? I don't think we should be ever ever be surprised that Dana White's emphatic about anything yeah. at this point. But, um, you know, it, it's such a tough spot Gastelum's in because he's just a little too big to be a welterweight, and yet, at the same time, he's a smallish middleweight. You know, he's been honest in saying that uh, he doesn't think he has the, the height or the reach to match up with someone like Chris Weidman and, and, or Luke Rockhold. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting spot. He's, I can see both sides of this situation. I can completely understand why Dana White, the promoter, looks at the fight tonight and, and says, oh, yeah, this guy belongs at 185. Um, I'm not sure how to make heads or tails of it. You know, I guess if you're Gastelum, you just keep... It's not like they're going to throw him in with Luke Rockhold right. or anything like that anytime soon. So I guess if if this is the way things are, you just get back to work and cope with it. You know, sometimes the UFC is criticized for putting guys in tough spots, taking fights on short notice. They have to cut a lot of weight. Do you have any problem with Dana saying, I'm not letting you go down to 170? Not when a guy misses weight by 10 pounds at, at welterweight. Not when he has a history of it, you know? Um... In this case, maybe he's being a little, uh, a little heavy-handed, but you know, I mean, that was that was pretty much chaos that fight with with uh, Tyrone Woodley, and Woodley doesn't deserve that, and you know, I don't know, it's 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 not the uh, n not ideal, but I can understand where Dana's coming from on that. Do you think this is it for Nate Marquardt? Honestly, I hope so. I don't I don't mean I don't take any joy in that at all, but. How's this going to get any better for him? You know, he's lost five out of six. He's been knocked out three times in that span. And uh, I don't know. I don't want to see it anymore myself. Now, a tremendous win for Yair Rodriguez, a youngster, a guy who Charles Rosa said wasn't on his level. He really showed us everything, including some some pukage after the fight. He, <laughs> he puked all over himself, which was nice. Um, you know, Joe Rogan was comparing him to Anthony Pettis, and there was some John Jones in there. I mean, do you think that this guy can be that good? That was a great performance, but I don't know. I, I think it might be a little too soon to put him in that category. I think that was uh, Joe being at his lovely most over-the-top. You know, uh, Joe has never been known for, uh, for kind of being even-handed about things. But, you know, I mean, we certainly, I mean, there was definitely a bit of a uh, star is born type of feel tonight yeah. between um, his popularity with the crowd here in Mexico City and just obviously he's very much an, an unfinished uh, product and he still... Um, needs a uh you know some more polish but i mean he was willing to go anywhere that fight went and charles rosa i'm gonna give a little props to my boston boy again but you know i mean i think he's marked himself as someone that win or lose you want to see his fights but uh rodriguez i mean geez after seeing a performance like that you have to think the they have to think the kids get a lot of upside yeah i'm i'm, I'm really excited to see how he uh, evolves as a fighter because his wrestling coach and really kind of his head coach at this point, Israel Martinez, who, as we talked about on, on Thursday, has worked with some of the greatest of all time at this point, is so high on him. I mean, he is so high on him. It's amazing to hear him glow. This is a guy who came into this fight, as Izzy told me, with just $400 to his name. And tonight he wins a $50,000 bonus. So kind of a bummer to hear that he only had $400 and he's a pro fighter, but nice that now he's a uh, I guess richer by fifty thousand dollars and has fifty thousand and four hundred dollars in his <laughs> bank, something like that. It's very late. Anyway, <laughs> one more thing before we go. Sure. Uh, let's talk about Henry Cejudo. Right. Do you agree with me that this was actually a blessing in disguise? Like it was a tough fight. He wins. He did what he had to do, but it was a blessing because it made us all say. Let's just slow down for a second. It's probably best that this guy gets a few more fights under his belt. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
I, you nailed it there. You know, I mean, we were, it, it was so easy to kind of want to get caught up in a hype train because we've wanted to see like someone who can really take it to Demetrius Johnson, especially where Cahuto has a pretty solid personality. His walkout was awesome tonight. I know it didn't end up airing on TV, but you see someone who has, you know, he gets the fight game, he gets the fight business, and you see someone who has all the tools that this, you look at him, you say, this is someone who's going to the top. But um, having a performance like this where, you know, it, it kind of opens everyone's eyes and says that, yeah, he's not quite there yet. Uh, blessing in disguise. You know, the knock on, Mighty Moss would croak him right now. Let's, you know, let's get real about that. Um, but, you know, a, a performance like this, and give credit to, um, give credit to his opponent tonight, who's, my name, his name is... Chico Camus. Thank you, thank you. Um, I, I think he's a little underrated, but... Yeah. Um, tough guy, wow, he real really brought tough it. out, real tough out. You, you don't want to, you know, you got to give him credit for his performance tonight, too. But, yeah, I think um, I think in the long run, we'll look back at this. If Cahuto does get to the top, we'll look back at this as a night that he just kind of took, like, a necessary sidestep. So John Dodson next for Demetrius? So um, if it was up to me, I'd go with Joseph Benavides, but I oh. under... But I understand why Dodson is a more sellable third fight crack for point. Joseph. Yeah, but you know Joseph is um, so against fighters other than yeah. Demetrius Johnson and Dominic Cruz, who are the two undisputed best fighters at their weight classes, twenty-two and zero. Wow. He's ten and zero in his last fights. Now I'm making his case while also saying that I want John Dodson to get the fight because it's a more sellable fight and a more bankable fight, and Demetrius Johnson needs that. All right, well, we also have to give a shout-out to Efren Escadero. Great win for him here in his home country of Mexico. Also, Patrick Williams, back-to-back, -back, two very quick submissions yeah, there. That, that before. Yeah, that was a, a very fun sequence. Tisha Torres picking up a win, but didn't really get the kind of win that she needed to take a big step in that strawweight division. All in all, though, the story, of course, new heavyweight champion. His name is Vai Cavallo, Fabricio Verdum. After everything he has been through pushing 40, he finally gets that belt, and now we'll see where he goes from here, and perhaps more interestingly, where does Cain Velasquez go from here? How does he rebound from this? Last time he lost, he rebounded very nicely, very dominantly. We'll see if that is the case this time around. All right, we're done. You gonna take a shower? Yeah. Yeah. In my room though. Okay. Here. Fair enough. We're done from here in Mexico City. Thank you so much for watching our coverage all week long. We appreciate it greatly. And we will see you Monday for a stacked episode of the MMA Hour. I think we have a few things to talk about. Yes, that is the case. Thank you so much. We'll see you on Monday for the MMA Hour. Adios.